think we know everything about our blue planet, but that's an illusion. Isolated regions difficult to access are still little known and are sometimes yet unexplored. The Lengaru Massif on the island of Papua is a stone citadel within which no human population has settled durably. Its foundations sink deeply into the waters of the Saram Sea. At the confines of the Indian Ocean, on the eastern end of the Indonesian archipelago, Lenguru has remained closed in on itself for millions of years. So much so that it has become a world completely apart. The species that have survived the cataclysms that rhythm the history of the region bear witness to the evolution of life. By adapting, they differed from the species of origin. It is said that they have become endemic. They are found nowhere else but here. Lenguru is one of the few places on the planet where an ancient world has remained unspoiled. This massive promises unparalleled discoveries to those who cross its forbidding barriers. The Lenguru Expedition is the largest scientific expedition ever undertaken in this region of the globe. Led by the French Research Institute for Development and the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, they head towards Lobo, one of the rare coastal villages built at the foot of the massif. The mission brings together some 50 Europeans and Indonesians, specialists from various disciplines. These scientists aim to understand how animals and plants found prisoners of Lenguru have adapted to survive. Laurent Poyot is the head of the expedition. This French biologist has widely explored Papua for more than 15 years. Through his travels, he has learned local languages and has earned the trust of the Papuans. Mana bos? Masih berapa lama sampai lobo? Tiga jam kita sudah tiba di lobo. On a previous mission, Laurent perceived the remarkable richness of the massif. He convinced Gono Semyadi, biologist at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, to participate in the adventure. And since then, they've never ceased building both the team and the large-scale project, aiming to elucidate the mysteries of Lenguru. Amos has guided Laurent and Papua for years. He knows, better than anyone, the difficulties that await them. From the sea, the citadel of Lenguru displays its seemingly impenetrable wall. Lenguru covers a surface area of 35,000 square kilometers. It's what is called a karst landscape. Tropical rainwater dissolved the limestone rock of the mountain. It carves out canyons and gorges, seeps into depths, and gives birth to many networks of underground caves. The massif was born 11 million years ago when the Asian tectonic plate collided with the Australian plate, thus raising mountains. The landscape that emerged created impassable barriers of high peaks steep slopes and deep abysses. The animals and plants that lived there before the mountains rose found themselves trapped. Their communication with the rest of the world completely ceased. They had no choice but to embark on a race for survival and adaptation. Everyone disembarks in Lobo, inhabited by no more than 100 villagers. On the dock, the community chief, Yoel Musmasa, welcomes the newcomers, while Laurent is greeted by old acquaintances. The scientists will all gather here to verify their final preparations. The arrival of foreigners is an event for the villagers and excellent news for those wanting to work. As resources are scarce in Lobo, the men immediately propose guiding the teams and transporting the material to the difficult areas. Uh, mamal dua orang. Uh, mamal itu maksudnya mamalia. Uh, yeah. Ada yang tentang kelelawar. 
on n'est pas des, des jungle men. Not jungle men, as they say. C'est-à-dire que Meaning même si on est bien préparé, well prepared, il faut savoir toujours qu'on est en ennemi aussi. Et donc, euh, so it's il faut toujours optimiser le temps qu'on passe en forêt. C'est-à-dire que moins on passe le temps et plus on fait de choses, plus on fait de choses. Les dice sont thrown. The preliminaries are finally completed, and the adventure begins. Each team must reach the zone where their mission takes place. One will identify underwater landforms in Triton Bay, another the La Mancier Mountain Forest, and a third the isolated lakes of Kamaka. The scientists have before them just eight weeks to inventory the species present on Lenguru. The underwater team sets off for Triton Bay. In this location, the only information they have on the seabed was charted in the 19th century. Since then, nothing has been done. The dive team's mission is to explore the coastal landforms up to 100 meters of depth and inventory the major families of organisms that inhabit the submerged karst. Lenguru is at the heart of what scientists call the Coral Triangle. It is the region of the world that offers the greatest marine biodiversity. It promises discoveries and wonders. The divers are immediately surprised. In Triton Bay, the big green has submerged the big blue. Numerous organic and mineral particles are in suspension. They come from the rivers that spring from the massive, penetrating far into the salted waters. Carried by a powerful current, these fresh waters lull the marine environment, laying on its floor a thick layer of sediment. The floor that the divers discover is different from those they habitually see. It seems that the distribution of species is upturned. Totally unexpected, it is soft corals, devoid of skeletons, that are the most numerous. The troubled water charged with nutrients seems to suit them quite well. We find them in all sizes, with the most extravagant forms and features. The team of divers find a strange Eden, fertile in unexpected encounters. This placid carpet shark, threatened in the rest of the world, seems to have found here a solitary retreat. A delicate sea feather, ingrained in the muddy bottom, filters the microplankton that drift on the currents. This giant anemone, with its Baroque tentacles, is a sanctuary for a colony of tiny translucent shrimp. As for these nudibranchs, commonly called sea slugs, they are unusually plentiful. These hermaphroditic mollusks, carnivorous and occasionally cannibalistic, parade in extravagant attires of astonishing forms and colors. Clearly, the marriage of fresh and salty waters has produced a surprising alchemy. Will the great depths be as surprising? The exploration must continue down where daylight no longer reaches. Laron penetrates into the coastal forest that surrounds Triton Bay, at the foot of the La Mancière Mountains. It is here that the bird, mammal, and reptile specialists prospect. Here we're in a low-altitude forest, which lies between the sea and the foothills of the Karst Mountain. It's an extraordinary, mysterious place. One might even say captivating. There's an absolutely exceptional diversity. Here, there are up to 100 species of trees per hectare, which is absolutely phenomenal. The limestone of the Lenguru Massif is porous. Rainwater that seeps into the rock descends deeply into the ground, out of reach of the roots of many plants. The lichens, mosses, carnivorous plants, and the great variety of orchids have acclimated and now survive undamaged the episodes of relative drought. All the fauna has also had to adapt to the singular rhythm. If the reptiles, birds, and insects are abundant in the forests of Lenguru, there are mysteriously no felines or monkeys, usually common at these latitudes. At 
up mid-slope of Lamansier Mountains. Ornithologists have set up a temporary <laughs> camp. <laughs> they consult the guides who know where the birds can be found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ada. How about this? Mambruk. Ada. One of the stars they hope to observe is the western brown pigeon. It is a species endemic to the region, very difficult to approach, and whose evolution remains mysterious. Everything in here, it's in around here, but you need time to catch them. Yeah, I know, I know. Christophe Thibaud of the French National Center for Scientific Research, Borja Mila of the Museum of Madrid, and Hidayat Azari of the Indonesian Institute of Sciences believe that here up to 150 species of birds can be found in a single square kilometer of forest. There is no equivalent anywhere else in the world. Ornithologists have found the ideal location to place their nets. The nice thing about this place is that we can actually get canopy species because we're very high, we're at the level of the canopy. So it's a very steep ridge on both sides. So uh, birds that are flying through the canopy at this height, they're not gonna go up here. They'll just stay at this level and continue. So we have a good chance of catching things that otherwise in the understory we would not catch. On the seashore, the mammal specialists led by Gono Semiadi explore the foot of the Lamansir Mountains. They are looking for a kangaroo described by the Papuans. I really looking now for kangaroo footprints. We are hoping we can get some indication of the presence of the kangaroo coming to the water. Oh. Looks like this is the last night footprint. You can tell from the moist of the uh, footprint. Habitually, kangaroos are plains animals. It seems though that the species found in Langaroo have adapted to the dense undergrowth of the low altitude forest. How did the animal succeed in adapting? The mysterious marsupial has never been photographed or filmed in its natural habitat. If Gono Semiadi can capture them on film, it would be a success, as nothing is known of the behavior of this small mammal. But the angle, this is about the right angle. This up to about the two meter coverage. Infrared cameras automatically activate when something moves nearby. Hopefully the famous kangaroo will be the one to trigger them. Well, well now, no one's ready, this patrol is going to take time. In Triton Bay, Moran and the divers are alerted by intriguing news. We know that there's a sedentary whale shark because it's fed every day by fishermen. And we're going to try to take DNA samples to be able to position it relative to the rest of the population. Whale sharks live in constant migration, following schools of krill and plankton that drift on the currents. But here in Lengaru, local fishermen say they are sedentary, so validation is necessary. If we put the word whale in front of shark, it's because of its exceptional size, up to 20 meters long for a weight of 30 tons. The pilot fish are numerous to feed on the parasites that thrive on its skin. The animal feeds primarily on plankton, algae, and microscopic animals, but curiously what attracts it today are fish trapped in the fishermen's nets. This giant is not aggressive towards humans. However, taking a skin sample requires proceeding with caution. Are we in the presence of a local subspecies that has become sedentary? DNA analysis of the Lengaru whale shark will determine if he is identical to those that roam the Indian Ocean, or whether over time, he has become a homebound cousin that ventures not outside of Triton Bay.
back at the camp, Gono Simiadi discovers the images recorded by the cameras. Against all odds, the image trap did indeed work. A big surprise awaits them. The films reveal that the Papuan kangaroo has developed an original mode of travel. Plains kangaroos use their tails like a spring in order to leap. But the Papuan kangaroo uses its tail like an additional foot to stabilize its stride in the very dense undergrowth. Cut off from the rest of the world for millions of years, this marsupial had no choice but to evolve to survive in an environment deeply transformed by the upheavals of the island. on the slopes of the Lamansir Mountains, ornithologists multiply their bird captures. Okay. Very nice. Beautiful spots. It's wine color and the golden underwings. Beautiful. Tout à fait magnifique. Oh, ho, ho. Both. Jarir, dapat di lubang. Ada di lubang. Iya. Oh, a pygmy parrot, unbelievable. A pygmy parrot is like a the smallest parrot in the world. Unbelievable. We've seen them, but we haven't. We have never captured it before. Yeah, you want to hear it? <laughs> Still bites though. Parrots feed on fruits and seeds, but oddly, this one is insectivorous. It climbs along trunks to peck off larvae and insects. Very spectacular. Very exciting. This is an example of the admirable wow. adaptability of the living yeah. organisms to their environment. It's, it's so tiny that it's not very easy. Laurent, in the company of Jacques Slembrook, the logistics coordinator, arrives in Lumera, the coastal village from which they will launch a mission to the isolated lakes in the Kamaka region. These high altitude lakes have evolved in isolation, and the presumption is strong that they have favored the survival or development of unknown species. Laurent hopes to discover new specimens of rainbow fish, a fish that is at the heart of his research for over 10 years. Ada danau kecil-kecil beberapa banyak. Kita pengen ke sana karena kata orang Kamaka memang ada ikan pelangi di sana. Kalau jenis baru kita apa namanya kita deskripsikan dan kita kasih keluar di di jurnal di Indonesia. Break, the team of scientists engage on their long and exhausting ascent to the isolated lakes of Kamaka. Given the tight schedule of the expedition, the explorers have only four days to reach the lakes. It is 35 degrees Celsius and with 90% humidity, the underbrush is stifling. 
However, to arrive on time, they must at all costs cover 15 kilometers each day. So much effort for a small fish measuring only six to eight centimeters and with a rather ordinary appearance might seem surprising. But with the success of cataclysms, the species was dispersed, generating communities that each evolved differently. The scientists will attempt to construct the rainbow fish family tree in correlation with the history of the massif. Marc Legend, biologist, and Jean-Marc Port, photographer, accompany Laurent. It's here. What's the matter? Look. Oh, oh yeah. What's that? You think it's a python? It's going away. Does someone have a sack? Yeah, here's one. Look at that head. I'm not sure it's a python. Eh? Look at the head, the way it joins the chin. There are sorts of vipers here. I'm not sure this is the same thing. Keep it from coiling. It's funny how the head is oblique. Very triangular. Okay, we'll keep it for the herpetologists. It's a good specimen. White tips, right? Very impressive. On the slopes of the Lamansir Mountains, the ornithologist's heart pounds. Oh, wow. Very nice. That's an amazing crown. This bird, sporting a strange and beautiful plume of feathers, is the famous western crowned pigeon. It is the largest pigeon species known to date. Endemic to the west of the island, it can weigh up to two kilograms. It can still, however, fly and roost in trees. They're looking at us. Yeah. They're not so shy. The origin of the species within the pigeon family is still enigmatic, and little is known of their behavior. Only certainty, the female lays one egg per year, which is one of the lowest fertility rates among birds and makes it vulnerable to predation. Perhaps with a feather. Seriously threatened, this species risks extinction almost everywhere, except within the fortress of Lenguru, which offers them a safe shelter. Despite their desire to speed up the pace, Laurent and his team need a short break. The ascent to the lakes is increasingly difficult. In places, the slope is a veritable wall. This endless trek is becoming a punishment. How can you expect to walk with such a thing? Look, a leech. Hey, look. That's where it hurts. Oh, that really hurts. Your feet get ravaged by the rocks. They butcher your toes. With fatigue, the team quickly dehydrates. But the water supplies are empty. Lianas, the only resources that don't convey dangerous parasites, are a savior. We've gone one kilometer since the pass. At this rate, we won't get there before nightfall. So we'll lighten the load of the slowest hikers. That way we can progress at two to three kilometers an hour. Then we'll be good. Within a few minutes, the forest is plunged into darkness. Nightfall surprises the team, but their efforts to accelerate the pace are rewarded. The first lake is finally there in front of them. Lurking crocodiles force the group to improvise a makeshift camp at a distance from the shore. Uh. 
Ah bah d'accord. Ah, uh, ok. Ah bah tu s'es bien gorgé celle-là. Ça te bête. Là, ça m'a se dépeut. Look how it moves. Tu m'as bien eu celle-là. Hein. It got me good. In this wild environment, leeches are not the only ones that prey on travelers. Mosquitoes, mites, and other parasites offer themselves a feast of human flesh. Suddenly, the Lengaroo night crawls with an elusive life. All the nocturnal species begin to hunt, and the night is full of sounds, cries, and songs until sunrise. Dawn, Amos went hunting, and the breakfast he concocts is almost ready. The camp awakens on the shores of the first discovered lake. On the islands of mud that resemble ruins, on the sunken trees, on the scarified rocks that line the banks, we read the level variations of a lake that ever rises and retreats. Rainbow fish are too fragile to survive in such an unstable location. To hope finding specimens amongst the oldest, they must climb higher still to reach other isolated lakes far beyond the Papuan hunting territories towards the unknown. In the coastal forest at the foot of the Lamansir Mountains, Evi Arida, reptile and lizard specialist at the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, searches within her chosen zone. Nothing is known of the lizards that inhabit this region of Lengaru. Evi anticipates capturing interesting specimens. Why are they endemic to this island? Why are they different in, in morphology? How do they diversify? And how do they come here? Dapat! Oi, oi, oi! Ha, ha, ha! Okay. What a beautiful specimen. And this lizard is uh, kind of special in that, well, normally lizards will have five fingers on the front and the four limbs, and five fingers on the hind limbs. This one, it has only four fingers on the front limbs, five fingers on the hind limbs. This is a specialty of a, of a group of skinks. There's a lot of uh, diversity. Um, the evolutionary history is also complex. These lizards are still found in leaf litter. However, scientists suspect that in order to escape predators, they more and more often seek refuge underground, much like snakes. Their legs are less and less necessary and so slowly mutate modifying their morphology. In Langaroo, researchers have discovered species already adapted to this new way of life. The individual that Evie has just captured probably belongs to a family that is evolving. Okay, Ligisaurus, catch of the day. <laughs> A guide, while clearing a piece of land, comes upon an animal that excites Evie's interest to the highest point. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I'm happy to see this specimen. It's a it's a good size of specimen, and um, I suspect this is a specimen of Rana syndicus, which is a member of the family Varanidae or Monitor lizards, uh, which is very common on New Guinea. But um, if you look at the pattern on the back, um, you know the very orange spots. It looks like it's maybe something different. Um, pressing its head, but otherwise it'll bite me and uh, it has some poison. <laughs> we'll check the uh, color of the tongue. The normal Varanus syndicus will be uh, with a black tongue. This one looks a bit suspicious to me. It's grayish, white, and I guess this is probably my chance to contribute something to the scientific world. You never know, this might be a new species. Woo! 
Mission is possible. <laughs> Accompli. Mantap. Makasih ya, Pak ya. Sama-sama. Higher in the massive, the team, en route towards the isolated lakes, finally arrives at a promising site. This lake is the most distant and most isolated of Kamaka. Will the team have the luck of finding primitive species of rainbow fish? Look, we see a fish struggling there. I'm going to take my shirt off. Don't pull too hard. I'll go release it. If you see a crocodile, let me know. They saw some earlier. It is still too early to cry victory, but Laurent has the premonition that their efforts to reach this lost lake have not been in vain. A small size, a head proportionate to the body, the bluish band, the orange stripes, everything suggests that the captured individual belongs to an ancient lineage that has not yet been described. It would be one of the rare specimens of the primitive species at the origin of all rainbow fish. The comparison of this strain with those that have evolved offers scientists a subject for study of primary importance. Everyone is relieved by the outcomes of these first five weeks. Whatever comes next, the results so far have already justified the launching of this expedition. This is a very interesting bird. It belongs to a family of birds that is endemic to New Guinea. And uh, notice this really long, decurved bill, because they feed on nectar from flowers. So it's a, a very nice case of adaptation to the environment. Well, basically, I'm excited to know what our specimen is, this Ronald Finchie. Oh, you never know that there's something else that well, we haven't known. <laughs> Gathered one last time at the camp in Lobo, the scientists get some rest. The expeditions that lie ahead will be arduous, but it is in the areas of most difficult access, where human impact is small, that their chances are highest to find rare, or even better, unknown species. The whole of the expedition now moves to create a new base camp in Orisa the last village nestled at the bottom of the Lenguru Labyrinth. The heavy rains that fall on the region delay preparations and waste valuable time. At the first let up, a team of biologists attempts the outing. Arnold Fai, entomologist at the Museum of Zoology at Munich, is an underground wildlife expert. Here we're in a zone where there's absolutely no data on underground fauna. We have some data for Papua, central New Guinea, but here we have no idea what we'll find. And we'll be meeting two fauna, so it'll be very interesting to see what we we'll discover. Like all the karst massifs that rainwaters dig and ceaselessly refashion, Lenguru is perforated like a sponge. Its bowels are an immense maze of caves and underground rivers yet unexplored. Four years ago, in the vicinity of Lake Sawiki, Laurent spotted a vast network of caves that he began visiting. These large bats take flight when disturbed by the researchers, announcing the proximity of the caves. In this underground labyrinth isolated from the world, Laurent had discovered, during a previous visit, a blind fish as of yet unknown. 
Okay. Let's go. Chayo. Arnold Fai and Chayo Ramadi, Indonesian spider specialist, venture for the first time into the underground heart of the massive. The heat is suffocating, the air stagnant and very humid, almost unbreathable. In the light beams, stone formations that have developed here over thousands of years take on the aspect of a petrified jungle. The darkness is total, and few nutrients reach this isolated environment. The species that live here face conditions of extreme rigor. This is the case of the fish discovered by Laurent. It became blind because, in this obscurity, eyes were useless. Skin pigmentation was also unnecessary. The red spots that appear by its fins are its gills and internal organs, seen by its transparency. The specificity, the specificity of underground groups is that they very often live in a somewhat insular system. The populations are isolated, fragmented, and therefore each population is likely to give micro-endemic species, meaning animals that live in very restricted areas. This is a raphidophoridae. I think that this is an adult again, very long antennae, and the eyes are reduced, because it's a troglophile, meaning it spends most of its time in the cave. So they begin to develop adaptations that are those of real cave dwellers, like the loss of eyes, loss of pigment, often an elongation of the appendages. Arno! You see? What is this? It's a whip spider. The genus is a sarax. Sarax. This is... Uh, it's known from here? I have no idea from this area. Oh, but so. I only know from Waigeo Islands in Raja Ampat and in Papua New Guinea. But in Papua New Guinea, it's uh, completely brownish. So, so maybe, maybe you species, no? I'm sure. <laughs> nice. Right. I will keep it. I have to be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, don't lose it. Huh? Yeah. The caves of Diabonyara held their promises. They are home to wildlife that has evolved in total isolation. It had to adapt to this world of darkness not to disappear. It will take other visits to inventory the secrets hidden in these treasure caves. As for the dive team, in the estuary of Orisa, they are preparing a descent of 100 meters. This is a first in the waters of West Papua. The objective is to identify the species living there from the floor to the surface. At 100 meters deep in murky water, the divers discover a twilight world. Luminescent squid pass like graceful apparitions while a jellyfish resembling a nuclear mushroom cloud drifts in the dark waters. This fragile heart in its beautiful dress, undulating gently in the current, is a tenophore. Tenophores are carnivorous organisms that feed primarily on plankton, veritable marine UFOs with translucent and gelatinous bodies. They can reflect light and disperse it in the form of colored flashes. Sample taking is methodical. It aims to identify the flora and fauna living in the various levels of depth. Captures are as rare as possible, and most specimens encountered are simply filmed or photographed. Though they resemble tropical flowers, crinoids or sea lilies are skeleton animals, close relatives of sea urchins and starfish. Some swim in open water, others attach to a support. They originate from the earliest of times. The first fossils were found in terrains that formed 500 million years ago. Thanks to their long arms, they filter the water and retain the organic particles on which they feed. 
Their quantity and their extraordinary diversity contribute greatly to the luxuriance of the Lengaru waters. Ascending to the surface, the divers come across old acquaintances like the white-tipped shark that hunts on the reef. I don't know what this is. Must look at the book. 70 meters. Uh, 70. Thanks a lot. Okay. Did you see? They were in shape. No, they were no, I didn't. Did you see some? There's one in contrafort, a sort of coral canyon with a great density of fixed fauna and species at 50 meters deep, found normally in 80 to 100 meters in New Caledonia, because light penetrates much more, and there are lots of species that do well in shallower depths, even though they are deep water species. Lengaru offers, in lesser depths, species that are usually found in much deeper waters. Once again, this environment surprises and intrigues, as made evident by this extravagant starfish. Uh, I never saw it in Western Indonesia. So in Eastern Indonesia, uh, only in here in Lengaru before. So many dives, and this was my first. Yeah. Time flies, the end of the expedition approaches, and there are still so many things that the scientists hope to accomplish. The highest summit of the massive, Kumawa peaks at 1,400 meters. Pop 1 hunters do not venture up there. The slopes are steep, the forest is impenetrable. While the average temperature is 35 degrees Celsius on the coast, it falls to 15 degrees Celsius in the altitudes of the peaks. These variations are at the origin of a great diversity of ecosystems. The ornithologists and botanists hope to discover new species. The men are heavily laden, and the Papuans themselves, though accustomed to these extremely steep slopes, are in difficulty. We see the summit, there. The terrain is super slippery. It's steep and slippery. It's one of the most difficult passages, I think. We're too low. That's the problem. The guys who have two bags can't make it. Two of them are really angry. Why are Tunggu di atas ada masa aqua, masa aqua. Kita minum, ya? Kita minum. Dari mi, mi. Baru. I think we, yeah, I mean it's 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 not going to be possible to go to the summit today. It's too long, difficult. But I think to have right now is critical. Let's eat and then we'll we'll talk again. Okay. The pop ones do not feel at home in this territory, where they never venture. Each hopes that a little rest will calm the spirits, because each member knows the final climb towards the summit will require great solidarity amongst all. The waters of Lengaru, rich in fish, are a paradise for dolphins who gather in great numbers to hunt. During his previous visit, Laurent spotted some unusual specimens. He asked Sophie Karoui, specialist in marine mammals, to confirm or infirm his intuition. But how can we find these individuals in such a crowd? Sophie goes to Arguni Bay, whose waters are troubled by the violent tidal flow. Here, the waters are murky because of the silt brought by the river. The currents are strong, yet dolphins are present, and it would seem that these individuals are those described by Laurent. We can't help wondering if it's a different species or even a new species. But that remains to be proven. This one has several characteristics that are different, and this is what we're trying to document. So yes, it has its exciting side.
Ils ont exactement les mêmes caractéristiques. Je suis sûr que c'est les mêmes caractéristiques. Ils ont exactement les mêmes caractéristiques. Tu sais, nageur dorsal. Tu vois la forme générale Oui. Pour moi, ça, c'est des dauphins du genre Sousa. On les appelle des dauphins à bosses, même si ceux-là, ils n'ont pas de bosses. Mais regarde un peu les couleurs qu'ils ont. Ils deviennent they roses pink quand ils sont adultes. Et mm. là, c'est pas du tout le cas. cas. On a des dépigmentations We localisées. Et au niveau de la tête, tu vois ce qu'on appelle le melon, cette well, bosse Eh bien, j'ai l'impression que là, elle est plus marquée, plus proéminente. Plus marquée. Plus marquée. Plus marquée. Plus plus marquée. Plus plus marquée. Plus marquée. Et donc pour toi, ce serait so une population avec un peu de variabilité de Sousa Alors, est-ce qu'ils sont différenciés génétiquement Là, il faudrait des échantillons. Only a comparative DNA analysis will determine if this species differs from others. It is impossible to dive in Arguni Bay. The troubled water and violent currents prevent approaching the dolphins other than by surface. But on that day, it looks like the dolphins want to play hide and seek. The aim is to obtain a tiny piece of flesh. It's a non-invasive form of sampling. It doesn't hurt the animal. animal. It's at the maximum distance normally to use such a tool. It's 10 to 15 meters. And this morning, the closest we could get is roughly 50 meters. So that's why this is really going to be difficult. I saw one in front of them. Pollen, pollen, the cap, the cap, soldier. Pollen, pollen. Tapa, tu tapa. Ada, ada. Ada daging itu. Ada, ada, ada. Ada, ada. Dalam 4 tahun sama dapat yang ini kan. 4 tahun. Sudah lagi. Sekarang akan tahu jenisnya mos. Ayo pulang kita. Aduh, saya senang sekali. Panas kali. Makasih, lumba lumba. Laurent savors his success. Amos's stress level drops. But as long as the Kumawa mission has not returned, no one is truly at rest. Mais ici, sur une crête, on appelle ça une forêt de lutins, des petits arbres, des mousses, des fougères, beaucoup d'orchidées probablement. C'est magnifique parce que là, on a monté très rapidement jusqu'à 1200 mètres et maintenant la forêt est complètement différente. Et ici, la forêt est complètement différente. Les captures se déroulent en succession. One catch surprises Borgia. This elegant sparrow in ceremonial livery resembles a berry pecker. However, its white breast is very different from that of its congeners. Common 7.3. Christoph and Borgia consult the Papua New Guinea bird inventory. It doesn't have the white. No, no, no. I don't know. It has the white, the black. Yeah. 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 Oh, this guy, I'm sorry. Yes, but he hasn't got the white on the tail. The specimen they have just captured is not listed. Unbelievable. And this is like a new record. In the past 80 years of ornithological exploration, only one new bird was discovered before this one. The two researchers are about to realize their dream, identify a new species and give it a name. The revelation of this delicate sparrow crowns the expedition with a final success. 
Two months have elapsed since the teams disembarked in Lobo, and now the expedition comes to an end. Lenguru has kept its promises. It is the Eden of biodiversity that the researchers foresaw. Between heaven, earth, and sea, it has delivered some of its secrets to the scientists. They penetrated into unexplored regions, observed wildlife in mutation with the support of the island's populations. Because it is a living conservatory and a witness of the history of the world, Lenguru deserves to be included in the world natural heritage of mankind.